You want to jump in? If you want to jump in, I can actually. I'm in the studio. So now, do I need to do something with sound here? Yes, and you can hear your mic. Okay. All right. Wow. That's loud. Is your thing? Uh, it should be off now. Okay. All right. All right, everyone. What is it? 107 p.m. And today's date is June 14th, 2022. And we are um, here at the uh, Santa, Santa Defonso Pueblo Health and Human Services Building. And we... <clears throat> Every month we have a uh, an awareness activity, event, or topic that we like to discuss and go over. And this month's um, awareness topic was National Safety Awareness Month. And so, <clears throat> in order for us to, um, you know, put put something out there that is uh, relevant, especially today, for the things that are going on in our communities and surrounding communities. 
um, we were able to invite a representative from the Santa Fe County Fire Department, Jeff Fulgate, to give a presentation or have a talk with us about uh, fire safety and readiness topics. So I know most of you have seen the flyer and seen the advertisement and all the things that have gone out to talk about today's activity. So if you're able to join live today, I appreciate it. I think we'd appreciate it if you can watch it later on to get a better idea of what we're talking about and learn some really good information. You can watch it at a later time. So with that being said, I'm going to turn over the uh, well, first of all, let's let's get an idea of who our guest is today. Um, Jeff, um, if you have an opportunity, you know, just take a couple of minutes and sure. kind of introduce yourself and give everybody an idea of who you are, what you do at Santa Fe County Fire Department, and uh, what you're going to be talking about today. Sure, absolutely. Um, uh, first up, first and foremost, um, I thank you guys for having me as a, as a guest presenter today. Um, I am Jeff Bolgate with Santa Fe County Fire Department. And my main job at the fire department is to serve as the fire and life safety education coordinator. And that's just a fancy way of saying, you know, educating people on fire behaviors and things that we can do to be safe from fire. Um, I am recently new to Santa Fe County and New Mexico. Uh, I've now been here a year, but my experiences go way back. So prior to Santa Fe County, I uh, was almost 30 years with Austin Fire Department. And so, uh, and prior to that, I was in the military uh, where I served in the fire service as well. So I have 30 plus years of fire service background. So, you know, I have a, a lot of experiences that I can share and um, I've had the opportunity and I've been blessed to wear a lot of different hats in the fire service as I've gone along, but I have always felt like my gift that I was given was to be able to really share the importance of public education and fire safety with our community members. And so, you know, that's everybody from preschoolers to children in schools, to our adults, to our businesses. Um, and I, I just feel like um, that's where I serve best in, in all of those years of experience of riding a fire truck, uh, you know, all the way through actually doing fire investigations. And at one point in my career, I was uh, even assigned at a federal level to work on a task force. So. Um, uh, you know, I have I have a wealth of knowledge and I love to share it. So uh, usually if I don't have a good answer for a question, I can usually find it and we can always get back with our with our folks that have questions about fire and life safety. <clears throat> well, thank you very much um, <clears throat> for that. And, and you definitely welcome me here and appreciate you, uh, you know, wanting to provide us with the knowledge that you have uh, collected over the years. <laughs> to share with the community. Um, inside the studio today, we have several other individuals and I wanted to kind of make sure that they are acknowledged for being here. We have a representative from, <coughs> excuse me, Natural Resources from the bubble here. I'm gonna grab the mic and just, just say who you are so people know who you are. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Aguilar, um, Parks and Wildlife Division. I'm um, here at the um, Sat under Lawrence Atenzo, who is helping me today. Um, I've been here about five or six years on the program of Parks and Wildlife. Um, my primary job will be patrolling the areas, um, looking at the borders, checking the lines, make sure there's no trespassers. Um, also, checking for the areas for any fires that, that might occur during the public lands, if, if there is notify the proper authorities. Um, all of us patrol the area for any potential air, um, dangerous uh, wildfires or animals that could be um, endangered, like endangered the people or the animals that are here in the village. So your work directly ties into what, what Jeff does too, so for the public. 
thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> we have other folks from the, the department here. Um, I don't know if you want to jump on or you want to just, just tell us who you are. <clears throat> you have Lenora <laughs> Arieta from Iqua that's here. We also have in the background here, we have Daryl and Martinez, our um, community health worker. And we have Victoria Martinez, our Healthy Kids, Healthy Communities Coordinator, and our gracious host who's going to take over from here. Um, I'll let her tell her, uh, you all who she is and then she can get started. Uh, yes, yeah, and my name is Ladon. I've been muted the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got to start all over. Start all over again. All right. Yeah, it's Esha Eladon Yazinch. Yeah. Um, thank you for everyone for, <laughs> for joining me. I had this really nice uh, <laughs> speech going. But um, like I just said, I'm going to repeat myself. But um, I'm Navajo. I'm very thankful that everyone's here to join us. Um, I just mentioned like how um, as Navajo people and I'm sure as other indigenous cultures, we um, really want to pay homage to the land, the mother earth that we walk on. And we forget about um, those living entities and those elements that um, go for go for, um, unforeseen, the fire, the water, the wind, the air, those things we kind of take for granted. And now they're being harmed. And I wanted to take this month, the National Safety Month, to highlight and to um, pay respect to those entities that we kind of have forgotten. So we brought in uh, Jeff Folgate from Santa Fe County to kind of share his expertise and his information. Um, I had also introduced myself. I'm the tribal public health educator. So as doing my part in providing um, the community with information um i just had a few questions but um everyone's welcome to chime in and ask questions um sometimes there's things i'm not able to um, put together or even say in words but um, i wanted information that's specific to the pueblo and the um the new mexico um, area all right so we can get started if anybody doesn't have any questions right now um, so, um, thank you for coming in. We wanted to take a look at the terrain earlier, but um, with um, the short time that we have, we wanted to get started with the podcast, but we can go ahead and do that later. I had, we had um, exchanged emails with natural resources to hopefully pull them into the conversation to see if they could add to our conversation. But right now I really wanted to, um, uh, maybe have those general questions maybe the community would have usually rural areas don't have the same questions as urban areas urban communities mm -hmm. so some of the questions that came up when we had some visitors come up from santa fe county was the debris in the community we have um cat uh, not cactus but um tumbleweed that can pose a threat to our our um our um 
our structures, our homes. So I want the first question that I have is, um, could you give us some tips or provide us with some things that we could do as individuals to mitigate um, fire hazards? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think specifically. just beginning indoors, but we can already see what's happened in the last month. So we are realistically just beginning to traditionally get into fire season, but we are so dry and uh, our conditions are so dangerous that we're seeing um, even prescribed burns and things like that are, are just getting out of control with, uh, with winds and the dryness, the humidity and lack of humidity. Um, at any time we have all of these things coming together, we really increase uh, the fire risk. So what I would like our listeners to do is first off, let's stop thinking about how we used to do things or what we have done in years past, because I think that will only set us up for failure. And I think what we need to do is we need to think about the conditions right now. And the conditions right now are at their worst that we've seen in some years. And we're seeing that with the fires. Um, you know, for me, it was, there was definitely a learning curve for me about wildfires because where I came from, wildfires were something that were easily controlled. We could throw enough resources at it to put it out and to have it under control. But in New Mexico, we have such open space and we have a different fire response. Um, and it takes longer for people to get here. Um, if there's something that happens on the Pueblo, then fire response is not three and four minutes down the road. It's going to take a while for firefighters to get here and to, to do their jobs. So we have a saying uh, with Santa Fe County Fire Department. We say, uh, we are one. And then we say that Spanish is nosotros somos uno. And when we say we are one, we there's a lot of different ways that we look at that because we are a, uh, we have districts, fire districts, and we also have um, regional districts, such as the one that you would see down the station that's staffed all the time down, down the road. Um, and then we have substations uh, with some of our district members um, who volunteer. And so as a department, when we look inside, we are one, but we are one with volunteers, we're one with, with uh, regional uh, pay groups, but we are all firefighters together. We're also one with our community because a lot of, a lot of things that I have always experienced um over my career is that people don't realize the fire behaviors and what they really do because when we if we don't experience them firsthand what are we drawing them from we're drawing them from television or what we see in movies and that is so far from reality and so one of the biggest challenges that i will always have as a public educator with fire and life safety is to get folks to understand that what they see is not reality. And that what fire really is, is it's very fast moving. It's very dark. It's very choking. Um, it's, it's all of these things that you cannot portray 
on a television show or on a, a, you know, a movie screen. And so that's always been a challenge. Um, and so back to your question, kind of bringing it around the we are one, we are also one with you as, as citizens. And in order for us to all be safe from fire, we have to work together. And that means not just depending on us to respond in an emergency, but doing what we can do to mitigate it before. So now, going back to your question, what can we do, right? Part of the we are one is as, uh, as a homeowner or property owners or just wherever you live, <clears throat> making sure that you have what we call that defensible space. So when it comes to wildfires, <clears throat> we talk about ready, set, go. Um, and you probably have heard that thrown around a lot <laughs> this last month. So what does that mean? So ready, set, go is a, kind of a three-phase wildfire preparation, uh, if you will, that, that citizens and, and community members can do to uh, help. And so they have to triage. Well, our fire crews have to do the same thing, and they have to triage what homes are defensible and can be safe, and which ones can't be. Um, and that's where it starts with the property owners making sure they have that defensible space. So, again, going back and creating you know the barrier between your property and like say, we have uh, in our pamphlet, we talk about basically 30 feet out is the first zone. So zero, 30 feet from your home or your buildings. You want to have that pretty clear. Uh, and you don't want to have things that can catch fire right up in next to your house. And then on the next 30 to 100 feet out, you treat that a little differently. And uh, you trim that up a little differently, you keep that space a little clearer, and then the rest of the way out from 100 feet, you know, if you have that much property, 100 feet further out. One of those is more uh, discussed in our pamphlets that we have. Also, kind of while we're on the topic, we do have a wildland specialist who uh, you can reach out to. And they can come out and do a home assessment with you and walk okay. your property with you and uh, give you some guidelines and some tips on what you need to do. Okay. Those guys are the specialists in this particular field. I am not, but I can at least guide and direct 
you know, our folks to where they need to be. So that would probably be one of the first things that I'm, you know, thinking just good common sense. Um, so now, now we've talked a little bit about debris and like, like, you know, tumbleweeds and things like that. Um, obviously we are in a burn ban, right? So traditionally, maybe we would have piled them up and burned them to get rid of them because they burn up pretty easily. Yep. But under these conditions, we can't allow that because again, what I talked about at the very beginning, we are not last year. We are not two years ago. Mm -hmm. This is different. These times are different and we have to respond differently and we have to realize that. And that's unfortunate, but it's where we are. And um, so what can we do with those things? Uh, right now, I know the county and the county commissioners have worked with um, some of the landfill people. Um, you might be able to help me on this, Bert, or some of the uh, Buckman, Buckman Road. I think there's some certain landfill where you can take uh, trash and things like that. They're offering free days um, where if you have debris like that around your property, you can actually take that to them and they will not charge you for the drop off. And they're doing that on, I believe it's the first Saturday of the month. And right now, I think because of the conditions that we're in, they're looking at extending that to uh, more days per month where you can get rid of your debris. They also have um, free tire disposal days that they offer um, every month as well. And so if you have these things like a pile of tires that surround your property, they don't need to be there. <laughs> you can get rid of them. And the only thing that's going to cost you is the time to get them off your property and dropped off. So uh, those are things that you can do that are, you know, we can do now that um, can make your property a little bit safer. Um, we, uh, do a really good job and we have a really good um, relationship with advertising with them on our social media. Okay. And so usually when those days and events come up, we try to put that out there. So if you're engaging with us on our Facebook and Instagram, you will also be attuned to when those days are coming up as well. Um, and our, uh, our site is really easy. It's Santa Fe County FD, all one word. Okay. So whether it's Facebook or Instagram, Santa Fe County FD. And that is a good resource because we don't use it in the social media aspect of just fun. Um, we really try to make sure that stuff that we're putting out there, we will do some fun stuff on occasion, like the chief's birthday was last at least this last week. So we'll put something out there. But most of the time, we really use it for educational purposes and for informational purposes. So it's a really good social media site to follow. So I encourage your listeners to do that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So there's so much that we can do in, you know, in preparing and mitigating some of these um, fire risk hazards. And so... I was not aware about the free um, tire disposable disposal day, so okay. that's really helpful. And then also the debris. I noticed um, a few of us are kind of compiling our trash, mm -hmm. our tumbleweed. Just just that information is going to be really helpful. Right. To that. Okay, so that leads into my next question. So do you recommend having a plan, you know, if some uh, fire breaks out? And yes. what would that look like for a community member?
opportunity uh, for survival in a wildfire situation. And the reason is, is because, um, you know, roads are going to get clogged up with people leaving, right? So uh, back to real quickly, um, we've heard the certain towns and communities or areas being in the in the ready ready stage or the set stage or the go stage and you may have heard that or your listeners may have heard that what that means is so if you're at the ready that is basically hey there's a wildfire in your area so you know making make sure that you're doing things like what we just talked about mm -hmm. to to kind of make your 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 property a little more defensible for firefighters should something happen. So that's any time of the year. The set is basically packing and getting things ready so that if you're given the go order in your community that you can get in your vehicle with your possessions and things that are important and that you need and can go to an evacuation site or to uh, some other location outside the fire wildfire area. On the go, so talking uh, your question about uh, in case a fire breaks out. So let's talk about go. Um, again, uh, waiting is not the best thing to do. Um, you hear people talk about, well, I'm gonna stay and I'm going to defend my space. I'm gonna defend my home and my property. I have a garden hose, I have you know, whatever, I have this uh, water source. Think a little bit about what happens if you don't have that water source and you're stuck there because of a main break or a water, something happens to your pump. Say you're, you're using well water mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you lose electricity. And so now you can't pump water um, and whatever backup systems you have aren't working. And so your grand plan of I'm going to stay and fight um, is now you've put your yourself and your family in a really perilous situation because you don't have a water source anymore. Mm -hmm. So think about all of the possibilities of that. So that's where we tell folks, if, if you're ready and there's a wildfire in your area, go. Don't wait. Come head on with fire trucks that might be coming the other way down some of these narrow roads. The other thing um, is is from your properties. Do you know we're you know we're we're so uh, you know cr creatures of habit and that we come and go out of the same road every every time we come and go. Um, but do you have another way in and out of your property in the event that you cannot evacuate from that area? You might or you might not. Um, but that is, that is one of the things that, that your listeners can do in advance is plan. Maybe there's a couple of ways out that we need to think about in the event that we can't get out this way because either fire trucks have blocked the road or the road is backed up or something has happened, that that is no longer an option for us. Do we have an option B? And again, not everybody does. But if you do, make sure that you know what's plan A and what's plan B route wise to get out to an area where you can, you can again, evacuate safely. So just thinking about that. So being on the reservation, I realized that I only have one route to get into my home. So that allows me to think about things. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the roads will get crowded because there's maybe one way to get into our reservation. So thanks for sharing That's, um, vital information, having a plan, being prepared, implementing that plan. But one thing that we were talking about earlier in our meeting 
was um, here at our, in our office. Can you hear me okay? Feedback. Yeah. Um, we were talking about how we would um, implement a staff plan where we're going to meet. You know, if something happens, you know, there's an incident, there's um, something that takes place as far as maybe fire or uh, maybe electrical fire. We we haven't implemented that because we have two sites here at the Health and Human Services. We have offices here and then we have offices in the senior building, senior center building. So we're looking at how we would go about um, meeting. So we haven't mm -hmm. figured out where we're going to meet, what sure. we're going to do, um, or even um, take attendance mm -hmm. to make sure everybody meets and knows what they're doing. And then to my next question, I would I want to move ahead. And um, this is something that I feel is also important for smaller structures. So looking at older homes, um, so some of the homes here in the Pueblo are older and maybe they don't have smoke detectors or carbon monoxide detectors. Mm -hmm. What is your recommendation as far as um, what's taking place here? Uh, really good question. So smoke alarms are vital in, with home fires. And um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So uh, we feel like there should never be a, a reason that a home does not have a working smoke alarm. And the key word there is working, right? So sometimes we have smoke alarms, but they're old or they're on the wall, but have we tested them to know that if it's a battery operated smoke alarm, which in your older homes, most likely they're going to be, um, do they, are they making sure that they're working? Um, also uh, kind of, well, I could talk for a long time about this and we'll spend a few, few, few minutes on this one. So smoke alarms, people don't realize this. Smoke alarms have a shelf life. They have a, they have a life and that, that life is basically 10 years. After 10 years, smoke alarms lose their reliability. And so at that point, they should be replaced. So if your listeners have smoke alarms, first and foremost, let's test them. Um, they use, they will have a test button that you will have to push and hold. And the key on there is, is hold it for a few seconds, because a lot of times it will push the button just really fast, like we're doing a light switch. And it's not enough time for smoke alarm to actually sound the test. So you have to push and hold that button for about two to three seconds. And if you're pushing in the test button and you're not getting anything, then obviously we need to check to see, okay, is that battery need to be replaced? Um, and if it does, it's just a matter of replacing it. Usually it's a nine volt battery. Um, and if it's battery operated and then testing it again, and then usually those, you know, those nine volts will last, uh, you know, maybe a year or so before they go out again. Newer smoke alarms that you're seeing now that we're putting up, um, you don't have to replace anything. Mm -hmm. They have a built-in 10-year battery. So it is back to the life of the, of the smoke alarm. It's good for 10 years. So if we put one on your wall, and when I say we, I'm saying that loosely because what we are doing, and, and I'll get into that, but we're partnering with the American Red Cross. So... So hang, hang on to that because there, there's no reason anybody in this Pueblo should be without a working smoke alarm. And if, if they are, we can, we can alleviate that. We can fix that. So back to uh, testing smoke alarms if you have them um, and, and making sure that, you know, you, you're testing, you're, right, you're holding that button. Um, so... Let's look back at statistics and why are smoke alarms important? Smoke alarms are important because of back to, uh, I talked about 
myths, right? Fire myths and, and how we think fire is going to behave. Uh, fire is super duper fast in a home, especially. So you realistically in a traditional home, um, and it may be, it may even be faster in a, from very small flame to the entire room flashes Flash over. I want to say 90 seconds. It's a little bit in that, but that's a good guess. Um, it's, it's averages around three to three and a half minutes, three and a three, three and three and a half minutes is not long at all. That is a very, very short window. Um, years ago, um, when things were built different, when uh, furniture and furnishings were made differently, mm -hmm. that was in the 30 minute range or, you know, and then it's slowly from the fifties into the 1960s and seventies, we've changed over. And then it was about 17 minutes and now we're down to three and a half minutes on the average. And, and the reason is because the way we build things now with so much plastic and, um, the way, you know, all of these plastics, basically, you know, that's a, a fuel source that easily once it, once it heats and ignites is really combustible. So our furnishings, the stuffings in our couch, all of that is now synthetics. And so, uh, they, they don't act like they used to like generations ago. So we have a very short window. Okay, so three and a half minutes. Keep that in mind. What is flashover? We talked about incipient stage to flashover. Flashover is when everything in that room <clears throat> heats up and the super hot gases heat up that everything from floor to ceiling flashes in a big fire. And then it flashes and then kind of puffs out and then continues to free burn. That is not, even for a firefighter, in all of their gear, in an air pack, if they were in your room at floor level, could not survive flashover. So if we can't survive flashover, you're certainly not going to fl survive flashover in your pajamas, right? Why do I say pajamas? Most of our home fatalities happen not in the middle of the day. It's between the hours of midnight and seven o'clock in the morning when we are asleep. That's when our fire fatalities happen. And that's when these fires get out of control and real quickly go unnoticed. So that's where, again, going back to a working smoke alarm, it's so vital and so important because you need to have that piercing sound to wake you. We think that I'll smell the smoke right? Another myth. I'll smell the smoke. I'll wake up. Um, no, you won't. So what happens is as that fire is kind of smoldering and starting and it's producing all the, the these uh, noc noxious gases um, and you're getting this black smoke that's kind of building up at the ceiling level and now it's coming into your bedroom or wherever you're sleeping, if it's the front room couch, um, and slowly banking down, you're breathing that in. And what happens is um, the carbon monoxide that is in, mixed in with all of that gas um, and smoke, it puts you into a deeper state of sleep. You do not wake up from it. You actually go deeper unconscious. So you need to have that early detection. Again, you have to have that within the first few minutes of that smoke alarm activating and waking you up. Okay. So that's where it's so critical. Um, and then we've talked about the time. You really have just a few minutes to basically get up, get enough awareness to realize what's happening and get you and your family out of the, of the, of the home, right? So that's not a lot of time. And again, let's think about, let's not think about the three in the afternoon fire. 
Let's think about the three and the four o'clock in the morning fire and how are you going to be able to respond, right? So you cannot, we know, we cannot depend on our nose. We cannot depend on our senses to keep, to wake us. It's not going to happen. You have to have the working smoke alarm. Now, how long is it going to take for a fire crew to come from the fire station to the Pueblo at three o'clock in the morning to your home to help evacuate your family? We're, we're, <laughs> we're talking about uh, probably. probably plus minutes, right? Easily. Who is going to save your family? It's exactly right. You are going to save your family. It's going to be your responsibility. You, you have to save yourself. You know, every once in a while, our fire crews, I must say, get lucky, but, you know, things just happen to fall out right for them to where um, the search circumstances are just, they're, they're lined up perfectly, mm -hmm. but those are rare occasions. And so it goes back to our, our we are one. We're going to be there as soon as we can. We're going to be there on medical emergencies. We're going to be there to do what we can, but we can't do it alone. You cannot depend just on us. You have to be there with us. Nosotros somos uno, right? Mm -hmm. We are one. We have to do this together. And so, um, uh, let's see, make sure I kind of covered everything. So uh, we talked about flashover, three and a half minutes. Response time for fire crews, way beyond that. So you have to have already been outside. Mm -hmm. So that's again, if I can't if, if I can't drive home the importance of working smoke alarms in today's topic, then we haven't done any good. Now, there's some new recent information that has come out uh, with the fire service, and that's through a lot of um, fire studies and actually building rooms and lighting them on fire and seeing how the fire behaves and how it moves down the hallways and things like that. Um, the other thing is if you sleep in a room where you can close a door, sleep with your bedroom doors closed. And again, it goes back to because it buys you time, right? So working smoke alarm, the smoke alarm sounds, um, that closed door will keep the smoke and the heat out of the bedroom um, to where it again, it's just, it's, it's giving you a little more insurance of time to actually evacuate. So if that's an option, some of our, some of our adobes, you know, they're so small mm -hmm. that uh, maybe we don't have doors or we don't, you know, necessarily in a, in a traditional bedroom where we sleep. But if you have that option, you definitely want to sleep with bedroom doors closed as well. Okay. Lastly, um, if we don't have those, right, we don't have a working smoke alarm. Um, we work with the American Red Cross. And um, if your listeners would reach out to you or somehow we would uh, work together to make sure that um, we can have uh, those installed, uh, that's something that we can do. Um, the only caveat to that is that the Red Cross, they receive those smoke alarms, those 10-year, right? So the 10-year, you don't ever have to change the battery. It, it's all just one closed unit. But they receive those through a grant. And a part of their grant requirements is that they make the installation themselves. So we would be there to help them. Um but they do actually have to install them in your in your home, um, okay. and that's part of their grant requirements. So we couldn't just you know have them available to hand out or to give out to people in hopes that they would install them. Um, they they would have to do that. But we have that if people cannot afford uh, a smoke alarm, we always have that option of providing them. Thank you for sharing that resource. Um, I, that was one of my questions was finding affordable mm -hmm. um, smoke detectors. Um, going back to our questions, we have a question about, let's see, the fire truck access to homes. So 
I, I believe the question is asking, are the trucks that are coming from the county, are they able to come into the Pueblo if there are challenges as far as it being muddy or inaccessible? What, how do you work around that? Um, so if you're, you're, so basically, if make sure that I understand the question correctly. So the road maybe that you live on is a very unimproved road. Mm -hmm. um, I know that our, our fire trucks, our fire apparatus, are, they do work. You, if you notice them, they, they don't look like your traditional fire trucks that you might see in a city. Okay. They're a little bit taller um, and they sit up a little bit higher. And one of the reasons is because we're a rural fire department response, okay. right? So the vehicles that we have, um, that's one of the things that helps us to make sure that we can get past some of these things that maybe uh, Santa Fe County uh, or Santa Fe Fire Department or Albuquerque Fire Department, they don't have to contend with. So our trucks are built a little bit different for that, um, uh, along with our ambulances as well. So um, and usually our, like our ambulances are a little bit smaller. Um, and again, that's by design so that we can get them in and out of areas where maybe traditionally it would be nice to have a little more room or a little bit of a bigger ambulance, but uh, for us, it just isn't efficient. So, uh, but ultimately, you know, on that roadway, we want to make sure that it's not so precarious that we can't get in, right? Mm -hmm. So, that responsibility i'm not sure i don't have an answer for that as far as is that go back to the pueblo to maintain or is that a county maintenance issue or you know is that a natural resources thing i don't know um but if somebody has a concern about their access or their roadway i think you know that's something that part of the ready set go that might be part of the ready you know making sure that that we're accessible pull in our natural resource um, specialist, Jose, to see if he could answer that question. Um, the, the gates are locked on certain, well, certain roads for now, for the time being. Um, there are certain people in the village that have keys to open those gates. And if there's a need to open a gate in the middle of the night, a person will get up in the middle of the night to open those gates if, it's, if the fire truck needs to go to a certain area. So we would want to make sure that um, that's kind of well thought out mm -hmm. so that we know that, you know, if we get a call and our crews are on the way, that everything in front of them is opened and accessible so that there's not a time delay, right? So again, time is, time is a, of, the, of the essence, not just fire related, but just any emergency, especially medical emergencies as well. What could the uh, what could the Pueblo do in conversation with the the fire department to kind of prepare for that? Because mm -hmm. there are going to be there are quite a few roads inside the Pueblo that are extremely narrow, mm -hmm. so access is always going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to get around and getting through these locked gates, mm -hmm. what kind of planning would need to be? Um, or conversation needs to be had with the fire department right. to kind of address that. I think that would have to be kind of a partnership between the Pueblo because you are your own, you know, you're your own uh, nation, right? So, um, and, and just working in partnership with us um, as a county uh, first responder agency um, through probably our fire prevention office and reaching out to the fire marshal and then he would probably assign that to somebody to make sure that we um, ultimately the authority lies with the Pueblo on what gets done. But we we can always give recommendations because I know we have recommendations um, on road width and turnarounds and um, it gets into, you know, what for a fire truck to turn around, think about, you know, we're, we're in a fire truck, we're not in our suburban, right? So can we get that fire truck in or, or are we having to come through and trim trees, right? To be able to even get down the road. 
Um, so again, going back to the ready, this is all a part of the ready part, right? Making sure that we can get in. Um, so making sure not just the road base is in good condition or in, in good enough condition that our, our apparatus can travel down the road, but also the widths of the road, are they wide enough? And, and can we get them through? Um, are we cleared of trees and power lines and things like that? Um, and so oftentimes we can even bring an apparatus out and kind of drive the roads and go, okay, well, this is accessible to us. This is not. So this is one that maybe you would want to put on your, your plan of, of trying to improve. And these are the things that you could do to improve it. We're always there to, to partner with uh, the Pueblo to help with that. And so um, I would say that whoever from the Pueblo end would want to reach out to us at uh, our prevention uh, office. Um, we would definitely, we would love to be able to work with you on that um, to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're ready uh, as we can be. Right, that brings up a good point that Leanne uh, mentioned. Our, she's, she mentioned how she's not aware of how when the last time the tribal office had a fire drill. So we have this in school, right? They have fire drills. And I think that's something we should consider, kind of do like a mock, um, something with the community, something also with the offices. So to make sure we're all on the same page or we're preparing ourselves or have a plan in place. I think that's an important. Absolutely. And I think, too, now that we're getting kind of a little bit, hopefully, a little bit past COVID, uh, we can do some things now that we haven't been able to do in the last uh, the last uh, couple of years. So um, start, start working together again uh, to make sure that uh, we're doing everything for our community. It looks, looks like that we have a conversation with natural resources and um, we're talking about prevention and we're also um, trying to figure out like there's some questions that they do have regarding hazard fuel reduction yep. projects and I think it would be good for us to kind of have to meet and to have these conversations so that we are working together with the county the tribe. Mm -hmm. yeah. A little bit on that topic. Um, I am always available for you as a community. So whether it be the daycare, the preschools, um, the schools, the businesses that are located within the Pueblo, mm -hmm. anytime that you want presentations on fire and life safety topics, um, I am more than happy to provide those and uh, you know, do whatever we can to make sure that we're safer um, <clears throat> as a community. We're developing programs all the time. This, this last year has been a very busy year for me, um, but I do want to talk about one of the ones that we're, we're looking at um, and we're going to be implementing at um, Chumayo Elementary. Uh, we actually had to postpone it because of the wildland fires. Um, but it is a program that we've developed called um, the Fuego Safety Squad, mm -hmm. right? So the Fire Safety Squad. And it is a presentation that we go into the elementary schools with. Um, and we it's, it's basically a PowerPoint slideshow for kids. Mm -hmm. And so the, the safety squad in that they learn about smoke alarms and the importance of smoke alarms different sounds that smoke alarms make, um, which we didn't talk about the chirp, by the way, uh, <laughs> but they learn about the different sounds. And then they also learn about uh, carbon monoxide alarms as well, which is hugely important, especially if we're using gas and, and uh, or we're burning, uh, you know, fossil fuels to heat our homes. Um, having a carbon monoxide alarm is also very critical. So we go through the presentation with each of the classrooms and then uh, 
the children at the end of the presentation, they go home with a couple of sheets of paper and they have these uh, assignments basically, or missions as we, we call them, to be part of the Fuego Safety Squad. Mm -hmm. And a part of that is they go home, they check their smoke alarms, they see how many they have, they test them, and then they bring that paper back to the school. And then from there, we can collect the data and we can look at, okay, do we need to do a smoke alarm installation drive basically in, in that area, in that community? And so um, that is something that we also can offer you guys as well is to to give that presentation to the if you have a school that's on the pueblo or something like that oh yes we have um the day school and then we also have a program that we're starting the summer program that we probably could um introduce you to the director they're putting together um just general information environmental information and then also indigenous knowledge topics but we could get you connected with their director so to provide them sure absolutely. yeah and just just again just realize that we're a resource there for you so um whatever it is that you you have the needs of for fire and life safety um we can build whatever we need to build um put together whatever we need to put together presentation wise so if it's very specific to your needs we can do that um so uh, we don't, uh, one of the things that we, we try not to do is to go out with something that's just kind of a canned product that's general fire and life safety because mm -hmm. it does not necessarily apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. It does not necessarily apply to Northern New Mexico mm -hmm. or in, does it apply to a Pueblo? Mm -hmm. So that pretty much, um, that goes into my next question, which is going to be difficult to, I think, um, answer. I wanted, before we have this podcast, I want to take a tour of the Pueblo and then get your feedback on what you'd seen and maybe mm -hmm. some information that you would provide us before we wrap up. But sure. We'll, we'll take a tour after. Yeah, absolutely. I actually did kind of an impromptu tour in the fact that I got lost. <laughs> So driving around in some of the areas, uh, <laughs> but what I did see was, you know, I didn't see anything that really stood out to me as, oh, this is an issue or this is, you know, but we will certainly do that after this podcast for sure. Okay. But I can tell you that, um, you know, things right now, obviously things are really dry and, and, you know, but one of the things I did not see in, in the Pueblo as I was driving around, as I did see a lot of uh, buildup of debris and things that could be a fire hazard around properties. Mm -hmm. So uh, at least not under my initial you know, driving around lost look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we let everyone know you were coming in. So maybe, maybe <laughs> that had something to do with it. <laughs> But yeah, that's all the questions that I have. I'm not sure okay. if anybody else wants to um, ask any questions. I do have a couple things okay. that we didn't talk about. Um, real quickly, going back to the smoke alarms, uh, the chirp. So that is something that um, we assume that people understand what that means. And uh, that's that's not a good assumption. So if you have a smoke alarm that makes the little chirping sound, the little bird chirp, and it chirps about once every three minutes, and of course it always happens right when you're going to bed, right? Mm -hmm. What that's telling you is one of two things. Either that smoke alarm is needing to have its battery replaced, or it's having some sort of malfunction and just needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting that chirp, the first thing to do would be to change the... Uh, um, the battery, if the battery change does not make it go away, then there's something else happening. And probably at that point, that smoke alarm needs to be uh, changed out. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk briefly about was carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. So carbon monoxide, what is that? That is a off gas of any type of fuel burning, whether it be from uh, charcoal, or a stove that's using natural gas or propane. 
or uh, if you're burning wood in a kiva or things like that, the off product of that is going to be carbon monoxide. Hopefully, everything is working well and your chimneys are in good working condition, then all of that goes up the chimney and out and it doesn't ever affect you inside, the, inside your home. But what happens is sometimes these, um, especially in the wintertime when we're really using our kivas a lot to, to heat our homes, or we're using uh, pellet stoves and things like that, and we're really stoking them up because we're having a cold snap. Um, we can kind of get things overheated sometimes. And so if they're not in good working order, one of the things that you can have is you can have carbon monoxide back into the home. You cannot smell, hmm. taste, or see carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. Carbon monoxide, what it does is it, as you breathe it in, <clears throat> typically right now, even through our masks, we're breathing in um, a regular oxygen, a regular air, right? And so our bodies, uh, the blood cells in our bodies are, the red blood cells are clinging to that oxygen and they're pulling it in and then they're exchanging it and they're taking it to our organs and then we're off guessing. Uh, uh, but that's how it would traditionally work for mm -hmm. us, right? So what happens with carbon monoxide? If we introduced carbon monoxide to this room, the red blood cells go, ooh, I like carbon monoxide 200 times better than I like oxygen. And so it displaces the oxygen. And um, basically, you your body starves of oxygen and you pass out from it. And till eventually your organs, especially your brain, cannot operate or function or live without a good supply of oxygen. So what happens is you breathe in the CO or the carbon monoxide rather, you breathe in the carbon monoxide, it clings to your red blood cells, it displaces your oxygen, and it basically kind of puts you into a deep state of lethargy mm. before you even realize what's happened, you're unconscious. Wow. And so, um, and then eventually renders you, it, were, it would render death. Mm -hmm. So carbon monoxide is called the, get this right, a, a silent killer, something like that, I believe. And so, and the reason being is because you don't, again, you can't see it, taste it, or smell it. Um, so how do we know if we have it in our homes? Um, carbon monoxide alarms, mm -hmm. that's, that's what we have that go by. So um, if you don't have a carbon monoxide alarm, that's also something that you might want to think about uh, investing in. Um, they have carbon monoxide slash uh, smoke alarm combinations that you can buy and put on the wall, or you can buy an just an individual carbon monoxide alarm. It can work off of a battery, it can also work off of a, just plugging it into a wall outlet. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you just locate those kind of in the central area of your home. Okay. And they're going to make a different sound. So smoke alarms, we know, make the beep, beep, beep sound. Mm -hmm. Carbon monoxide alarms make a beep, 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 beep. So it's four versus three, and it's very fast. And that's by design so that they're not, you know, so you know that there's a difference. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing. So I uh, wanted to talk about that. And then, of course, the chirp, you know, the, the individual birdie chirp sound that we sometimes hear. That means there's something going on with your, your smoke alarm that needs to be uh, looked at. Right. Right. Thank you for sharing and, and distinguishing between the smoke detector and the carbon monoxide um, detector. I know that they do they sell them in combination. We came across them. And we try to have one in our home, but I know they run a little expensive to have them in your home. And I, and sometimes that can be a, a challenge to even think of your safety that way to value. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Sometimes we don't think of our, our lives or the people that we're living with and thinking that's a precaution that we could consider. So. Not sure if anyone had any questions or if you want to address any questions. I have a question. Okay. Um, so 
because of the the, the fire burns <clears throat> and you know all the everything that's going on in the world um the, the tribal a lot of folks in the tribal community use um controlled burns like to burn their weeds and trash and things like that um and because of the burn ban a lot of the stuff that's collecting is collecting because we can't burn it exactly <laughs> so um my question is what would be a recommendation for a community this this size if that's what we're we're, we're facing because right. we're stuck with yeah all of the tumbleweeds we and are all definitely these things stuck. it's like we're right we're, so what are we doing with absolutely that? we are definitely stuck right now between a rock and a hard spot we really are because it's like we're you know we're these things are blowing in tumbleweeds are blowing in debris is collecting but like traditionally we can't we, we would burn them mm -hmm. right and be safe and things would be good and we would you know clear that debris unfortunately the conditions are such right now that we can't recommend that so the only alternatives that we have are one going back to disposing them like putting things on a trailer and then dumping them um at these uh at the and i'm gonna have to get that name right but it's the recycling where they do all the recycling and all the trash disposal um but that would be right now the only recommendation that i know of um you know maybe there's something else out there that i'm not thinking of but i had uh, i had a call from a gentleman the other day and he uh I think he actually lives up somewhere in this area and he was talking about all of these tumbleweeds that he's collected and piled up and he was looking to get a burn permit and to burn them. He goes, you know, it's going to take me 30 minutes. My neighbor's <laughs> going to help me. Um, you know, we're going to be very safe because if I don't, they're just going to collect in the bosque. And then when the rains do come, they're going to clog up the bosque. So, you know, I, sympathize with him all day long but unfortunately i cannot go yeah you're good to burn mm. uh we just we or something that again we didn't plan for that but it happens um unfortunately and and we're seeing that obviously on a federal level right of those guys that did those prescribed burns they're looking at a lot of data they're looking at uh, weather reports they're looking at all of this stuff and and even for them it got it got out of hand and out of control and we all know this is not the first time that this has happened so when the professionals struggle in these conditions and they have to reevaluate and we are reevaluating by the way on a national level right so national forest right now they are not doing prescribed burns until they figure out what's going on because our weather patterns have so much changed so things that even they were doing in the past they cannot do right now so bringing it down to us we cannot do what we did in the past so you know there's not a there's not a good answer <laughs> i wish there was but there's not a good answer beyond hauling it off um and you can haul it off and get rid of some of that debris for free but you know it's it's a whole lot harder to do mm -hmm. and it's a lot more work than than what we would have traditionally done with that stuff you know i've seen in the past there's been uh some communities who have invested in like the um the mulchers mm -hmm. and the uh the wood chippers right and they use that to basically pulverize it because that's sure. the only way <laughs> to get rid of it but when you're talking about a community this size how many of those do you need and <laughs> how right. often do you are you going to be able to get to know, that that's to me that is great thinking outside the box mm -hmm. do do you guys as a pueblo look at something like that for a long-term investment mm -hmm. And then have kind of within your pueblo that you would offer that service to where, okay, instead of having to trailer this up and get rid of it and haul it for a long ways, we do it in house. And so, 
uh, we offer and have that service available where it's confined and really watched. Um, and maybe that's a good solution. Yeah. Um, so again, that's just thinking outside the box of we have to, we can't think of what we used to do. Yeah, we need to exactly. think about how we, how do we work and do things going forward? And that may be a great solution. Um, the other thing uh, I want to talk about um, also with all of that mm -hmm. is making sure that um, we're also careful about certain things. You're seeing it on the roadways now where they're, they have the billboards mm -hmm. and they're, they're they have the little flashy letter signs and they're talking about um, making sure that you're not disposing of cigarette butts. All right. So in, in years past, maybe we could get away with that. But today in the conditions that we are in, um, that's, that's, you know, might seem like an obvious thing, but let's think about some other non-obvious things. Mm -hmm. If we're hooked up to a trailer and we're towing a trailer, making sure that we are not dragging chain chains mm -hmm. because trailer chains on a highway will throw sparks, a lot of sparks. And again, if you look at your odds, right, your odds are that probably wouldn't cause a fire in the past, but in the conditions that we are in now, where we are in extreme fire danger, that can cause a fire. So making sure that we're having our trailer chains, you know, wrapped up to where they're not dragging on the on the hard pavement. You know, that plus the fuel that's coming from vehicles, you know, you, yes. you creates that combustible space. Yes. Exactly. Recipe for disaster right. kind of a yes, thing. Absolutely. So there's a lot more than just mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff to think about. Right. Another one would be parking on grass. So maybe yeah. we parked on, you know, we park in a grassy area and in certain conditions, that's okay. But um, if you're parking on grass in these conditions where, again, we're in the extreme, um, let's think about the vehicle and talk about the catalytic converter. So the catalytic converter, for those that don't know, is a part of your exhaust system um, that runs from the motor all the way back to the tailpipe. And the catalytic converter uh, traditionally operates um, at, I believe, it's around 1,000 degrees. And that's when it's in good working order. And then it cools off, you know, obviously as you're uh, going down the road and things like that. But if let's say you went, uh, you took a trip and you went and got some things and you came back to the house and you parked on the grass. And now you have very dry combustible grass touching the catalytic converter. So what I was telling you at a thousand degrees, now your engine is stopped and that temperature of that catalytic converter because you don't have the air movement mm -hmm. is now going to increase a little bit before it starts coming back down. So that will increase to a temperature that can easily ignite dry vegetation. So making sure that if we're pulling off on the side of the road or we're pulling off on property or we're going to a friend's house, um, being really careful about where we are parking our vehicles and thinking about the underneath of our vehicles and what we're parking on. Mm -hmm. So again, another fire cause traditionally is probably okay. Mm -hmm. In these conditions, it's not. Okay. Yeah. I don't consider that. I know we were driving um, to Albuquerque one day and somebody was hauling um, some hay and somehow that the hay caught fire and we were trying to figure out how did that happen? because it was on the top of the stack of hay. And it probably was the, you know, the tides that were rubbing in the wind. So it could have been anything or it could have been somebody throwing exactly. out the, the cigarette bud. Right. So that whole trailer was in, in flames. And we had, there was different um, fire jets coming out down the road over by, I think it was Santa Domingo. I can't recall, but. It, it was it was interesting to see, but to you know, just the questions: How did that start? Right. Yeah. Some things we don't we, we don't think about. And then we have another question about any tips on grilling outdoors. I know we have a fire van. How does how does that work? Do we um, is that something that's not allowed? 
So mm -hmm. grilling, grilling outdoors, mm -hmm. correct? That is a potential hazard. Right. So uh, um, the way it's working right now under the burn ban that, that the fire marshal has put into, into play, um, outdoor burning obviously is not allowed, <clears throat> and that includes some outdoor grilling. But there are some caveats to that. So when we say outdoor burning, <clears throat> um, we're talking about uh, barbecue that would involve wood or charcoal would be something that would not be allowed right now um, because those things aren't easily as easily controlled. Mm -hmm. But if you have a propane or uh, a gas fired uh, grill, those are allowed mm -hmm. as long as, you know, they have the, what, what quote unquote, the emergency shut off, which would basically be if you can shut the gas off right at the valve, um, that's considered your emergency shutoff. So you could shut your grill down if something got out of control. So that's allowed. So if you're you're doing um, if you're grilling and you have either like I said propane or uh, you know a natural gas type of setup, then you can you can grill with those. Um, and you can also grill. They you know now we're making uh, some grills that are all electric, and mm -hmm. so that would be the other option. Had some good questions coming in. That was something I didn't consider. I thought it was completely off. It wasn't allowed. But thanks. Anybody else have any questions? Think you're on anything? Um, no. A lot of stuff that I wanted to ask was asked. Oh, yeah. Asked and answered? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, one of the struggles that I think the community is going to have is <clears throat> trying to adapt and adjust because this is the way that things have always been done, right? right. Um, and we already have an issue with water access. Uh, if we did have sort, you know, a, a you know, a bunch of fires, um, <clears throat> but also, um, you know, the burning is something that's always been done. Like I live out in the county area, Rio River, Rio River County. And people are still trying to sneak and burn and getting, you know, getting busted, you know, right. but, you know, it, what if you know, those kinds of things might happen? And I'm just trying to, you know, think about how we as a, as a, an administration could try to get that message out right. to the community about how important it is to avoid that because it is your, our normal habit. You know, this is what we normally do. And as we drive around through the community, there's tumbleweeds against the sides of the buildings and people are like, uh, you know, I just want right. to, I just want to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's good that you're having these conversations, at least bringing it back to, um, you know, back to the, to the front of people's minds thinking mm -hmm. how it's too dry. We shouldn't be doing that. This, it's not a safe thing to do. We shouldn't be doing that. We don't right. have a problem now, but if we start burning, what kind right. of a problem will we have? So right. just, I'm just thinking about how to get that right. messaging out as you're, as you're speaking, yeah. because it's important to, you know, to remind people that. Absolutely. Now, um, I do think, uh, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that, we are getting close to monsoon season and forecasts and things that we're hearing are positive, right? So hopefully we will get the rains that we maybe didn't get so much last year or we haven't been getting in the spring. Um, then we'll get those and we can lift some of these burn bands that we have and we can, we can clear up some of this stuff. Now that's going to be, you know, we're, we're kind of dependent on weather, but hopefully we'll see some of those changes happen. And then, so, you know, that's not, it's not all gloom and doom, you know, it's not, uh, hopefully it's not never going to rain again. <laughs> so, uh, but we, we, yes, unfortunately we are in the situation that we are in and we just have to think differently. We have to think outside the box. We have to Think not just about ourselves. We have to think about our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, there's things that we want to do, but there's also, you have to realize there's certain liabilities that can come back to you if things go away. And and they very easily can because of the extreme conditions that we're seeing. Mm 
but hopefully we're seeing we're going to see some weather pattern changes here and we're going to get this month the monsoons um and we'll be able to lift some of these things as soon as we do um i think it's time for people to um do maybe a little a little bit uh uh more forward thinking about the ready on the ready set go right and making sure that we're prepping for the next dry season mm -hmm. because there'll be one coming around the corner you know so this is uh you know and it may be this winter it may be uh next spring again uh we don't know uh but if i would have told you in december this last december oh by the way new mexico is going to see the largest wildfire that we've ever seen happen, right? And before we even get to wildfire season. Oh, and by the way, we're also going to have the second largest <laughs> wildfire in New Mexico history that we've ever seen. Mm. You know, people would be shaking their head at me. They would be questioning that, but it is where we are at. And so, again, we just have to keep it, like you said, I think you made a good point troy we just have to keep it in the forefront of our mind and realize these are where we're these are the conditions that we're in and this is where we're at right now it's not forever so let's just kind of band together as a community going back to the we are one right so we are one for fire safety we all have to work together of course it's so difficult coming out of a pandemic and all the other crazy we've been dealing with for yes. the past two and a half years. This is just something else to pile on top of it. But, you know, the community is resilient. Absolutely. People are resilient, and we yes. have to look at it from that perspective. Yeah, so, we're resilient people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're all done for today. I want to thank you for coming and providing us with vital information, and we'll be having conversation in the future, um, gathering, and then just providing um the community mm. with updates and we also i believe we brought some pamphlets to share we'll have that available here and yeah i, think that's I did good. um lastly well first off i want to thank you guys for having me um uh, it's always a pleasure to to be able to come out and talk to our to our residents and our community and so you know i take great honor in that and so i'm really appreciative of you guys inviting me to come out and do this um also uh we did not talk about alert santa fe um but that is the uh official emergency notification system that's used by the county to communicate with our residents um during emergencies mm -hmm. so we talked about the ready set go and that you know we're letting citizens know when they're <clears throat> whether they're at the ready set or the ready stage or the set stage or the go stage one of the key components of that is through alert santa fe and so the uh the community can sign up for that that's a free service that's offered through the county um and i'll leave information on that as well um but and i have some pamphlets that i'll leave you with on that but there uh that also is something that we want to encourage our residents to sign up for if they're not already signed up and you can sign up and you can uh customize your alert santa fe to meet your needs you can put as much or as little information in there as you want and you can sign up for a different uh array of different notifications whether it be traffic or weather or you know wildfire or whatever it's really handy especially for like when you have uh traffic accidents and things like that if they if there's a road closure uh, you'll get that notification if it's affected in your area so you you wouldn't necessarily get it if it's affecting you know edgewood mm -hmm. um but uh because what they do is they're able to pull um from your address information, your location, and then uh, kind of customize their alerts that they send out to you. And like I said, you can you can go to town with this thing. You can put a picture of your pet. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell them the color of your house and what side your utilities are on and all of that. I mean, it's just, again, it's, it's how much you want to get into it. But that is a system that we definitely want to encourage um, our, our listeners to also um, if they're not signed up for Alert Santa Fe, to be able to uh, do that as well. And I'll, I'll leave some of those with you guys as well. Perfect. 
Sounds good. Thank you for that. And I think we're good to wrap up. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we had some good questions, uh, some good participation, good information. Uh, and again, what we'd like to uh, thank Jeff for coming out and uh, talking to the community, talking to us, sharing the information. It's definitely um, something that we need to continue to do because as things change, we need to come out and keep keep informing the community. So if you're if you're open to coming oh, back absolutely. out again, yeah. definitely uh, we'll reach out to you. Um, hopefully, um, you guys, you and Natural Resources can collaborate on a joint message that that is very specific to Sanai. That would be a great thing. So I'm sure Jose will be able to go back and talk to the director and say maybe they can they can do that. But that would be that would be something that I I'd, I'd like to see in here um, mm -hmm. as well. So again, um, from uh, on behalf of uh, our department. I'm I'll say the community as well because you have folks uh, that are saying thank you in the, in the comment section for you all coming out. We'd like to thank you for coming and and, and doing this for us. We really thank you again, it. and so, and I'm always uh, always glad to come out and, and present and talk. So uh, again, I am a resource there for you. So perfect. Utilize me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for putting this together. Appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> All right, and at just two thirty-five, and we're going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all for joining. Have a good day. Bye.